Hello, everybody, and welcome to Changing Saskatchewan's Tech Ecosystem to Empower Indigenous Women. We're so excited for this webinar today, and I know we're going to have some people who are filtering in yet. So I'm going to share a little bit of information while people are, are coming in. Um, so very first, before we even begin, I'd love to share land acknowledgement. Um, as we gather here today, we acknowledge that we are on Treaty, treaty 6 territory, the traditional lands of the Cree, Salto, D Dene, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, and homeland of the Métis. We pay respect to the First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place and reaffirm our relationship with one another. And this is a particularly important land acknowledgement because what we're doing here today is really getting into the position where we're kind of joining worlds and uh, really trying to see what we can do to be really leaning into uh, the, the truth and reconciliation number 92, um, especially around economic reconciliation. And so there's some really important things that we're going to be talking about today. We've got an incredible agenda ahead of you. Uh, we as at Ethical Digital have uh, done some research search uh, over the last year that we'll be sharing with you. We'll have our, our uh, wonderful Alina Perot sharing that information. And then we've got two incredible speakers coming up. And uh, the, both of them are women in technology. We have Sharon Angus from SIIT and Leanne Belgard from Akawe Technologies. And they're, I'll be sharing their bios as we move forward with today. Uh, but in the meantime, we have some really incredible speakers and I know we're going to have an excellent day together. So very first, uh, there's just some housekeeping. Uh, there will be time for questions at the end of the session. We're going to have about 10 minutes. But in the meantime, feel free to add your comments and questions in the chat box and uh, at any time. And we'll make sure that the panelists get a chance to see those and answer some of those questions. Um, we're also asking that uh, you do keep your microphones off during the session. But feel free if you want to put your camera on, you are more than welcome to. Um, but uh, either way, no problem. And uh, also, we just want to talk about respect and good intentions. So this is a really safe place to share experiences. And, and please make sure that all questions come from a respectful place as well. So as we move forward with uh, uh, talking about some of these really important topics, I would really like to acknowledge our advisory committee as well. Um, one of our advisory committee, or two of them, Sharon and Leanne, are both on our advisory committee. Uh, we also have Carrie Harvey, who's the CEO of Innovation Saskatchewan, uh, Jordan McFarlane, who's the executive director at Cultivator, which is a, a, an accelerator out of Regina. Uh, Shelley Panici, uh, the Regional Communication, sorry, Community Relations Lead at Argyle. We have Alex Shimla, who's the Executive Director at Colabs, which is an accelerator here in Saskatoon. Uh, we have Max Scudra, a partner at Mogwate. Uh, Milton Tatusis, the Chief Economic Reconciliation Officer at Srita. And uh, we have a couple of other uh, people who are just joining our committee in the next short while. So we'll be, we'll be posting those uh, new members on our website as well. So uh, one of the first things I would really like to share is a little bit about, uh, sorry, and here's the session agenda. So uh, essentially we're going to go through, we'll have Alina speaking, my apologies. Uh, we're going to talk about the findings from our report, uh, how we uh, conducted the report and some of the high level things that we've learned. We're going to have an incredible interactive conversation with our panelists and then time for questions. So thank you so much. So I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, myself. I'm, I'm the Katrina German. I am the CEO of Ethical Digital. And uh, essentially what we're trying to do is change the trajectory of the internet. We would like for it to be more inclusive. There's a lot of reasons for this, but we do have a way that we're approaching this called our theory of change. So what we like to do is start with research um, and uh, we work with a lot of academic institutions and people guiding that particular process to make sure that we're really making, making decisions based on strong information. Then we turn that into education. So we do have a lot of uh, corporate training options, including this, if you want to uh, be sharing with your organization more information about getting more Indigenous women in technology. Uh, we also uh, do things around social media and well-being. So how social media is affecting uh, mental health and productivity for yourself, your family, your employees. Um, and then basically the next area that we have is the idea of commitment. And so we are actually in the process of launching uh, a new uh, certification process for marketing professionals so that they can be creating as much content for the online space as possible that is inclusive in nature. 
Um, we're also creating some tools. Stay tuned for the fall. Um, but then the most important part of all of this is action. So anything that you're learning here that's changing your mind or, or making you think about things in a different way, we really encourage you to take an action, whether that's reaching out to us at Ethical Digital or to one of the speakers, or really bringing this forward within your communities and just talking about this and, and sharing this information further. Because shining a light on something always, you know, can often make uh, some really incredible change. So moving forward, uh, let's begin. I'd like to introduce Alina Perot. Uh, she has been working, uh, she's a, a proud band member of the Muskegon First Nation and was raised in a small French community called Zenon Park. Alina has worked in many different areas, including media outlets, government and private sectors. Alina's educational background includes a bachelor degree in sociology from the University of Saskatchewan and a master's degree in journalism from the University of Regina. So welcome, Alina. We're so happy to have her as the main coordinator of this project and uh, really looking forward to having her share what we've learned. So thank you. Welcome, Alina. Thank you very much, Katrina. Hi, everybody. I'm Alina Perot, and like it was mentioned, I'm a proud member of Muskegon First Nation. Um, I had the privilege of being the coordinator of the project, and when I had stepped in, um, we were already, uh, uh, I guess, at this point, putting together the report. So just wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about the report that that and some of the highlights of the report. Um, so essentially, we were able to identify four um, themes or issues within uh, the data set that we had. Um, so the first one is Indigenous women are interested in the tech industry, but face significant financial barriers when pursuing training and or careers in tech. Um, so again, this one was the number one challenge, uh, which unfortunately wasn't too much of a, a surprise to me anyway, just um, considering the lack of funding in a lot of different areas. Uh, number two, Indigenous women are interested in tech training and careers, but are not uh, but are concerned that they would have to leave their families and communities to access opportunity. Again, this has to do with uh, training location and the fact that a lot of Indigenous women on reserve would have to actually relocate in order to um, access training as well as any sort of career in tech. Uh, the third one is Indigenous women noted that educational and professional requirements are barriers to pursuing training and careers in tech industry. And again, what we've learned here is there's quite a few Indigenous women who have bachelor degrees, but a lot fewer have certificates and diplomas. Um, so we wanted to investigate that as well. Um, and the fourth one was Indigenous women's family obligation and childcare often keep them from pursuing training and careers in tech and industry. So we heard from some participants that felt that their number one role was to be a mother and a daughter and a sister. And then after that, that's when they could take a look at their professional careers. Um, so if we could uh, just change the slide, I have a little bit more details with numbers. Um, so again, the theme number one was Indigenous women are interested. So they are interested in the tech industry, but one of the biggest barriers was the financial barriers. So we found that 47% of the respondents noted that funding and money was what the number one barrier when pursuing careers in technology. So that was definitely uh, the number one by far. Um, that definitely was a barrier that was holding a lot of Indigenous women back. Uh, theme number two is Indigenous women, again, are interested in tech and careers, but are concerned that they would have to leave their families and communities to access opportunity. Um, as you can see, 28% of Indigenous women noted that training relocation and career location is a barrier. So essentially not only that, but with the relocation that, that requires a lot of uh, money and funding to actually pick up your family and move to the city, um, as well as a lot of them would leave community supports and family members behind. So um, essentially what they're being asked is to choose between a career in their community, which um, you know is definitely problematic in making that choice. Um, next slide. Excellent, thank you. Uh, theme three, Indigenous women noted that education and professional requirements are barriers to pursuing training and career in tech industry. So one of the key findings was 24% of Indigenous women noted that their current level of education has been, uh, has held them back and are uh, from working in the tech industry. And again, I note that a lot of the times it's a lot easier to get funding for a bachelor degree than it is to get funding for a certificate and a diploma uh, based on some of the feedback that we did here. Um, as well as a lot of the times um, the women feel, well, they have bachelor degrees, but they don't really feel that those skills could be used in a tech industry. Um, so those transferable skills um, 
was one of, another thing that we we observed. Uh, theme number four: Indigenous women's family obligation and childcare often keep them from pursuing training and careers in the tech industry. And again, here our findings were nine percent of respondents noted that childcare and family obligations were obstacles in attending training and career in tech fields. So a lot of the times, um, what you'll notice is there's a lot of Indigenous women who are raising children on their own. And so it just adds a level of complexity when they have to take care of childcare, come up with the funding for childcare in order to actually take training. So uh, again, we'd like to address that and kind of facilitate something there to make it a lot easier on them. Um, all right, and then uh, next slide. So again, um, you know, when we talk about tech in, in, in our report, uh, we took a really, really uh, wide approach to tech, the definition. So a lot of people will assume like tech is to them, it's like design, uh, a designing, or it, it can be a number of other things. However, with us, we took a fairly uh, broad approach with tech. So, you know, it could be anything that, you know, being comfortable using, let's say your phone or, or other aspects of tech. So just wanted to make sure that, um, again, we've used a fairly broad um, um, definition of tech. The mythology, so how we did our research um, is very important, I know, for uh, the project to uh, rely upon the Indigenous Advisory Board when it came to creating questions that we would ask Indigenous women in regards to the barriers. So, um, and also there was, um, sorry, there was a team put together, of um, two Indigenous women uh, who went out and facilitated uh, some of these interviews and then also collected the data and put that all together. So in total, we did 57 one-on-one -on -one interviews, which was excellent just because we could get more deep into some of those barriers and 66 online interviews, uh, which were done with surveys. So essentially that just helped us to see if there were any trends that we were, that we maybe we were missing or we needed to see. And so that's essentially how we, we put that together um, and then created the report. So um, I think we've just really uh, found out a lot of uh, the key challenges and basically talking with other Indigenous uh, women in tech, it sounds like um, this has been also some challenges in their experiences and they've had to address in order to be successful. So uh, with that, that is kind of uh, my spiel and thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alina. I really appreciate you sharing those details. And uh, for anybody who's looking for a copy of the report, we will send the link out to everybody after this event, as well as a recording of the uh, of this session. Um, so we are, you know, very excited about the report because it's sort of the first step of. Uh, what can we be using? You know, we're basing this based on data and actually making some changes in the Saskatchewan tech scene. So we started off also just focusing on Saskatchewan because it is a small group and it, this, this project actually came, it was funded by Women and Gender Equality Canada, um, but it actually came about because it was from the technology community. I was working in that space as I, I do a lot of work in women in technology. Um, we, we don't have, we don't have nearly enough <laughs> and uh, I believe technology is there to solve problems. And so there's whole groups of people who are not having their problems solved uh, because it's just, you know, not as much access to this really, really influential sector. And so I just really think it's an important thing that we start, uh, you know, connecting in all parts of our, our group here. And the cool thing about Saskatchewan is that, you know, everybody's almost a phone call or two, two connection points away from each other. So we can really get things done quickly. So we really want to be focusing here, but we're also sharing these results with people across Canada. Um, the results of this report have gone out to incubators and accelerators across across the country. We're also sharing it uh, with media. We've had a lot of media attention around this topic. And uh, it's really important as a first step to start this conversation and really start to actually start to see that action and those action points. So thank you so much, Alina, for sharing that. But I all think that we're all here, um, really high level information. I'm glad we got to share that. But we really want to hear the stories of some of our women who are, our Indigenous women who are in technology here in the province. And so we like to see that Sharon is an OG. She's uh, uh, she's gonna she's on our advisory committee, but she's also been involved um, in the IT industry for almost twenty years. And this is a really rare thing, like not only to have an Indigenous woman, but having a woman in general being involved. So she's got a lot of stories, and also SIIT is doing an incredible 
incredible job with their program. Uh, they have a lot of women who are registering in to be educated, Indigenous women who are being educated, um, which is really incredible because a lot of other accelerators and uh, different training programs have difficulty um, getting women in general involved. And so I think SAIT is a real leader in this particular space. So very excited to, to get to meet her. I'm just going to read your read your bio real quick for, for those. Uh, but Sharon is a Cisco certified IT instructor for the IT support specialist program at the Saskatchewan Indian Institute of Technologies for the past three years. Sharon has worked in the IT industry for almost 20 years with 10 years of training experience, using her experience to train the next generation of IT specialists. Sharon may spend her days in the SIIT Saskatoon campus, but it's seeing the success of her students that gets her up in the morning. And no kidding, what an incredible, incredible amount of work that Sharon's doing. Uh, and we'll now introduce Leanne Bellegarde. So Leanne Bellegarde is a co-founder and president of Akawe Technologies. She's from Treaty 4 Territory and is a member of the Peepikasis, <laughs> sorry Leanne, <laughs> First Nation. Uh, she's passionate about delivering meaningful inclusion for Indigenous people in employment, business, and corporate philanthropy. She's an experienced global lead for strategic inclusion with a demonstrated history of working in the mining and metals industry, advancing participation of Indigenous peoples, women, and youth in the industry. And I'll also just say uh, Leanne is a passionate supporter of getting more Indigenous women involved in technology, as well as investment. She is really involved in this space and has been doing a lot of incredible work, including uh, participating in some of our media interviews. And, and really sharing her voice and her platform to making this happen. So thank you so much here for being with us today, Leanne. So maybe we can take down the, the uh, um, slideshow there and we'll put up the, the presenters. And uh, in the meantime, please, as we're going through some of these questions, please, please, please feel free to put your questions right in the chat box. Uh, there will also be a time if you want to unmute and uh, and ask a question at the end, that's also going to be available to you. But in the meantime, put any questions that you would like in the chat box there. And so let's just begin. And, and Leanne, you are first on my screen. So I'm going to direct the first question to you. But tell us about your professional journey and your experience being an Indigenous woman in technology. Well, you know, I'm still trying to figure out where what I want to be when I grow up. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks and hello to everyone. It's nice to be with you on National Indigenous Peoples Day uh, during National Indigenous Peoples Month. I'm in Saskatoon in uh, Treaty, Treaty 6 territory, but um, and I've been a long time guest here from Treaty 4, so I'm pleased to be here with you. Um, so yeah, how, how, how do I, after 30 years of uh, working in, in law and business and uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, end up uh, thinking I'm going to coast into retirement, uh, heading a, a tech company. Um, probably over the last 10 years or so, I got to be involved in a couple of projects um, that involved clean and green tech and um, smart cities. And one of the things that became very clear to me was the lack of Indigenous inclusion in any of those opportunities. We just weren't at the table. And for someone like me who's at the table and hoping to bring others to the table, when I look around and can't find any, it's really daunting. Uh, and so it became really clear to me that there was a great opportunity there. And more importantly, as I thought about how the next seven generations will participate in economic prosperity, how they will make a living, then it became really clear uh, and I think we all experienced it during the pandemic, that life is incre increasingly online. Um, we can do so many things online, um, not that that means in real life should be uh, shortchanged. But when I looked at where the opportunities are for the next seven generations, um, issues of connectivity and underrepresentation and everything else aside, um, I had to think about could I contribute in some way to inspiring uh, and starting to seek a course of change that would see us be involved in, um, in the world of technology, which sometimes people think is, you know, some big daunting fancy degreed kind of opportunity. Um, and, and yes, absolutely credentials are important and there are opportunities, but 
Um, I think that there's also increasingly um, self-generated, self-taught, um, lots of ways to learn in place and on experience in the broad sense of technology careers. Um, so um, I've gone back to school in my own way by learning myself uh, in the deep dive of becoming um, the, the lead of a, a tech startup, but also trying to understand where all the opportunities are for our people to connect them in because there's virtually little or no pipeline for talent here. I love that. Thank you so much, Leanne. And uh, Sharon, can you, how about you? Tell us about your professional journey. Oh, Sharon, are you, uh, are you there? Oh, yeah, she was having a little bit of <laughs> tech issues. So we'll see uh, if she joins us. There we go. Got it figured out. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thanks, Sharon. Um, well, actually, I, I kind of fell into technology. Um, at first, it was, uh, I was going to university to get a Bachelor of Arts, which I actually never got. <laughs> uh, but my computer broke, and uh, I couldn't, I was a single parent, um, like a lot of young Indigenous women are. And uh, I couldn't afford to pay somebody to fix it, so I had to figure it out myself. Once I started getting going with that, I just kept going, like, what else can I do? What else can I do? So, um, and then it got known around my community when I was I had moved back. Um, and I was, uh, my cousins all knew I was like, oh, you're good with, you're good with computers. Why don't you take this job? And that jo first job was just training community members how to uh, use basic technology, right? Um, and then from there, it just kept going snowballing afterwards. Uh, one of the things that I, uh, what got me really interested in this, in this project in the first place was that um, all the recommendations that are made and uh, that are made at, uh, as a result of the findings, I had access to, which really made a huge difference. I don't think I would be where I am right now if it wasn't for all of those opportunities. Uh, first, first being when I got my official training rather than apprenticing, uh, I got my A plus certification. Uh, it, I was I took a course through a um, program that Kuwait and Career Development was offering, and that that was um, unfortunately, and it was all online. It was totally virtual, and unfortunately, it doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> uh, but it allowed me, it was a paid internship, allowed me to take care of my kids. Uh, I was just very fortunate. My sister was living with me at the time, so I had childcare. I didn't have to relocate my family just because uh, the whole thing was online. I got to stay in my community and help my, uh, help the people on my reserve learn more about and become more comfortable with technology. Uh, as a result, I kind of fell into a, the training aspect at most of my jobs. So it, everything led to me being here at SIIT, which I'm really, really proud to say, and I love my job. I do get, it does help, help a lot. Um, of course, teaching is stressful, as most teachers know, <laughs> especially when they wait until the very last second to send everything in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're in finals right now. You're probably uh, <laughs> a little bit swamped. Oh, our program, our program wrapped up at the end of May, so. Perfect. Uh, I'm, I'm just chilling now for the next couple of months. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Love it. And I think your point is really uh, well said. Like for me, I often tell the story. I was a single mom. Um, that's why I got into technology because it gave me some flexibility around my kids' schedules that I could work at different times. And so, um, and I'd also say too, you know, even about the certificate, there's certainly some skills that people do want those certificates for, no, no question. But there's also a lot of other ways of getting involved in technology that's not just the, you know, the developer side, right? Or the things that you want the certificates for, you know, it, it, technology companies need the same things as all, all other companies. They need marketers, they need business development, they need finance people who are specialized in technology. And, and so I think there's so much many opportunities, you know, just to, you know, to get involved in different forums. So I love that you took the, the hard tech route. <laughs> um, Leanne, could I, you yeah. 
Oh, Could you tell sorry. us a little, just, little bit? I take all the hard skills. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Leanne, could you tell us a little bit more about Akawi Technologies and what you're accomplishing there with that company? Yeah, so Akawi Technologies is really um, our attempt to bring um, bridge the digital divide for Indigenous people across the globe. You know, just a little goal um, to really create a, an Indigenous internet and Indigenous blockchain, which I think is is Web 3.0 and where I think our next seven generations will play. So we, we do, but we do a broad range of, of, of things. We build apps and websites. Uh, we uh, facilitate go-to-market strategies and content development. Um, and we do some engagement and consultation depending on the nature of the, the product that has, has to be developed. and. Um, so we we respond to what clients are looking for in terms of product development, and one of those examples is working with um, a Northern Ontario First Nation um, entity on developing in, in developing the digital support for their Indigenous Emergency Operations Command Center, um, and so that meets a need as we all are in the midst of fire and flood season uh, in many of our communities. That's a reality. Uh, and all too often, emergency services like that are handled by third parties who come in and are one-hit wonders and take off. Well, this is a nation that's going to take charge of their own, and they want to ensure that everybody is connected uh, during times of crisis and in between times, um, because they don't just look at emergency services as fire, floods, or whatever. They also look at um, intervening um, and investigating around human and sexual trafficking and missing murder Indigenous women and girls and suicide inter um, intervention and um, community security. So it's it's a really robust app that's client driven. Um, one of the other things that we do is we have our own products that we develop for ourselves for marketing and and um, that we co-develop with other people um, to license for sale. And this so one of my own babies, um, which is my own product that uh, Akawe, um, uh, I would like to see Akawe launch with me is uh, what I call A-Connect. It was based on Aboriginal connections. Um, it's really trying to connect, answer the call to connect Indigenous people to biz business and employment opportunities. This is a chronic challenge um, that's not being really well solved. Uh, locally, uh, nationally, or globally. And so this would be more than a job board. It is actually going to have a proprietary matching algorithm to match people and businesses with opportunities. And it will have some accountability with dashboards that show how well you're doing. So um, whether it's responses to applications you've made or whether it's a company wanting to know how well they're doing in, in matching and actually taking people beyond the initial pipeline of talent to actual positions and where those positions or where those opportunities are in their organization. Um, so that would be a self-developed uh, app that we um would look to stand alone and and uh, and make a great product from. But we're also looking at playing in areas like indigenous art and design, digital tokens, tokenization of that. Uh, and we're um, got a number of other products. And of course, we always will do the basics as so often starts for people as websites. Mm -hmm. Build beautiful websites, a kind of designed websites, and um, we've built up great relations and, and the embodiment of some Indigenous uh, freelance artists to really ensure that not only are we building our product um, as much as we can by a free uh, through an Indigenous lens, um, but also that that translates into our product development sort of support through the infrastructure we're developing um, with blockchain technology for the future as well. Um, doesn't mean you have to say your blockchain. It just means we make you ready for now and for seven generations from now. Thanks.
Love that. I love that. And we're starting to get some questions in, in the, in the chat, which is fantastic. And some being sent privately. So we're going to get to those in a, in a moment. Uh, maybe Sharon, you can just quickly also talk about your, your programs and, and how people are getting involved in what you're offering at SAIT. Um, sure. Um, so this program has actually been around for about 20 years. Um, I, it used to be a two-year program, but now it's a one-year program. So we cram a lot into, into 10 months. Uh, there's uh, 10 courses. Uh, I teach half and my coworker teaches the other half. Uh, he, came into, he came into technology from a, uh, from a different angle than I did. He was more about IT management than the, the hard skills. Well, I was, I was sort of a boots on the ground frontline kind of thing. Uh, for most of my career. Um, so I teach, uh, like I said, I teach the hard skills, uh, networking. I teach the first two levels of, CC, of the CCNA, uh, Cisco certification. Uh, there's three parts, unfortunately, of course, it's only a one-year course, so we only get through the first two, but um, it's, as far, as far as I'm concerned, that's pretty much all they need, right? Um, once then there's hardware, software, which is usually how people find an interest that they have, they're, they're into technology. Uh, one of the first questions I ask every year is, how many of you are gamers? And of course, half the class will put their hand up. And <laughs> so um, I said, well, we're going to be learning a lot more than that. Like they, they usually have built their own PC uh, gaming rig, right, by the time they get to our class. So hardware and software is usually the most boring for them. But once they start learning about networks and virtualization, which I teach in the second semester, um, it becomes, um, uh, the concepts are a little bit more high level kind of thing, right? And a lot of them, I'm sure if I ask you guys the same question, um, how many of you know what virtualization is? I don't see any hands going up. <laughs> <laughs> like I've worked in this industry. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but the thing is, is I try my best to use the, that lived experience and what my own, my own experience with uh, all of those things, hardware, software, networking, and virtualization to give context to the students. And uh, you guys are getting a free lesson right here. Um, that virtualization, if you are a gamer and if you've ever played online games before, uh, such as Call of Duty with your friends, then that's virtualization because that game isn't actually running on your console or on the PC. You're connecting to servers and playing the game there. That's what virtualization is. If, uh, a lot of people just, if they, once they know what it is, they think it's just a computer, a, a virtual computer inside of a physical computer. But with gaming, I'm able to identi identify with the students and things because, yes, I'm a gamer, too. <laughs> I've been playing for all my life. <laughs> so it's, um, the once they leave our program, hopefully that they, uh, they have a good understanding and they don't need to know everything. And I tell them that all the time in class, just as long as you are willing to learn and that continual learning experience. And that's the great thing about technology is, is that it's always changing. So I'm never bored, right? There's always something new to learn. And uh, part of the reason why I just, I love this job and seeing that other people, um, most, of the, most of them are younger than me. <laughs> Some of them are a little closer to my age, but um, yeah, I think I'm probably old enough to be most of their mothers and <laughs> mothers. And, <laughs> but it's uh again um, i'm i just turned 46 um last week like a week ago and it is still something that i love doing and learning about there's always something new there's always going to be new software there's always going to be new hardware uh more law and everything like that the transistors keep getting smaller and it gets it's really exciting seeing that because it's always in constant evolution. And that's what excites me the most about it. And being able to see all these students come in from all their communities uh, and being able to share that, that love of technology with them is really exciting. 
I love that. I'm I'm feeling pumped up right now, Sharon. I have no doubt that you're, you're getting your students going too. Um, let's go over to some questions from the from the crowd. Uh, we the one of the first questions we received is uh, could the group speak to the level of connectivity in the indigenous communities across the province? So I'm assuming that means like actual connection to the internet and that sort of thing. And so uh, maybe uh, Leanne, did you want to take this one? Sure. Well, you know, connectivity is and remains a challenge for Indigenous communities and rural Saskatchewan. I think that's pretty well known and pretty clear across Canada that Indigenous people are underserved. Uh, and some of that might be the remoteness of the site. Um, some of that might be the way the provincial telco system offers connectivity, um, you know, that last mile to uh, a band office or a band school becomes a jurisdictional and financial challenge for many. Um, and, you know, one of the things that, that we saw that we faced um, in working with the Northern Ontario community who does emergency evacuations often in remote areas and there are people who want to shelter in place or uh, go out on their trapping, hunting, fishing lines or their cabins. Um, one of the things that, that we had to, to recommend they look at there was using something like Starlink. Um, satellite uh, internet connection um, for those kind of options and increasingly I'm finding people using options like that because connectivity is and remains such a challenge and I think it's just a further um, marginalization of economic participation of Indigenous people that needs to be solved and I, I don't think it's frankly going to be well solved uh, and hasn't been well solved by uh, provincial and federal government initiatives at this point, unfortunately. Um, we try to deal with the people that have connectivity. Um, that's the sad reality, but um, surprisingly, um, our people still manage to get online, uh, however limited their current connectivity is. So um, it, it's still possible, but out to some of our own reserve communities, uh, it's a challenge. And it's, it's a sad challenge in this day and age that I think um, really deserves us to call, uh, call out and uh, ask to be resolved. Thank you. Uh, did you have anything you wanted to add, uh, Sharon or Alina? Um, I would like to say something. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that Starlink is such a big thing for our communities. Even when I took that um, uh, took that original training from KCDC uh, and their program, uh, I couldn't actually do it from home because the internet speeds weren't there. And when you're doing it virtually, everything um, the video chops up or the the audio as well right and it's difficult to upload large files if you're because at the time we didn't I, all I had was dial-up or satellite um, you know so it really sucked <laughs> especially certain times of the day if the, because a satellite like that type of wireless technology has to be line of sight right and 20 years ago when I first got into it it was uh a relatively new technology, but it did allow me to connect. Unfortunately, I had to go, uh, I was just really fortunate, sorry, I was really fortunate that Thunderchild, that's my, my community, uh, offered me a uh, space in, in the band office, right? So I could connect and I could take my, do my training without those, that type of interruption. Uh, these days, so Starlink is so, um, is having already having a huge impact. A lot of my students who coming who are coming in say that they use it up north because every year we get uh, a couple of Laurent students. This year we had four. Um, so northern Saskatchewan, they're coming in, and of course the four that relocated were all men because uh, the women can't afford that type of relocation, right? Uh, but it's really great to see, and I'm hoping that my presence in the classroom uh, encourages more women. The first year I was teaching at SIT, I, we only graduated one woman. Uh, and she's working now, which is great. Uh, and the second year, I think there was only three. This year, 
we had um, six okay. graduate. So I'm seeing a, a continual increase in uh, not only uh, female enroll enrollment, but being able to carry it through to the end. And of course, they they don't experience the same uh, issues that our, our Indigenous male students have, right? Uh, because again, they have to relocate their entire family. When I was taking the program, I got to take it in uh, in that virtual environment, so I didn't have to I didn't have to relocate my family. I had two young kids at the time. Uh, right now, my co my co instructor and I and our program director are looking at options to increase enrollment in the class by offering the entire thing online as well right so um it, because we're already it, we're already capable of it um my my coworker and i we both record all of our all of our lectures uh and stream them on stream them live while we're have while we're doing our lectures because uh oftentimes the you know they get sick or something this is it all started when COVID was happening right so we were doing it virtually anyway, just like all the other schools. Uh, but we continued the practice all afterwards. So that way, if they have, you know, their kids, they got to go talk to the school principal or their kids are sick or all, you know, any sorts of things or they get COVID, right? <laughs> and then they have to, uh, they have to um, uh, stay home. Uh, they don't fall behind this way. And Seeing as how how well it works, I you know we're we're looking at expanding that enrollment to include that. So that way maybe we could get more women in, in from northern communities or remote communities who would otherwise have to relocate their families. I love that. Oh, this is an important first step. So I'm going to go on to another question that came in privately. Um, and it's what is one thing you would like to tell non-Indigenous partners, co-workers and peers about how they can support your day-to-day -day work and long-term career success? Who wants to go first on that one? <laughs> let's go, Sharon, let's go with you. Yeah, yeah, we had Leanne first before. You want me to go first? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I've I've had the I suppose you could say good fortune of working mainly in Indigenous uh, communities. Uh, I worked with, of course, in my own community. Uh, I've been I've worked with BATC and STC, uh, the Battle for Agencies Tribal Chiefs and the Saskatoon Tribal uh, Tribal Council. So. We, I tended to be surrounded, and now of course I'm at SIIT, which is also an indigenous organization. <laughs> but uh, I tended to be, I tend to be surrounded by, um, you know, indigenous people on a daily basis. Uh, but to have access, to see that, and, and just to be there in encouragement and um, support, and without without judgment, knowing what you know, the types of types of communities we tend to come from, like, you know, with uh, issues at home and everything. Uh, so it would be great if just being there <laughs> and just showing support and, you know, hiring is a big thing too, right? Uh, Horizon has been great. Uh, working with us uh, is one of the one of the companies that our program works with because there's a two week work work placement after at the end of the course and they've consistently taken our students and it's just been really great so seeing that support from Raj and Suze is awesome amazing Oh, yeah, great one. Yeah, so basically, and we can see your your cat appearing, <laughs> making an appearance. I love it. Yeah. Um, how about you, Alina? Uh, you know, what, what would be some of the things that you would say to some non-Indigenous partners? Um, well, just based on some conversations I have had is, um, I guess to hold like, you know, I guess to hold space for Indigenous, um, you know, Indigenous women to work in the community or to work within an organization and you know, not just to hire the one off, you know, you need a community um, and an investment. And, 
you know, um, also, you know, recognizing the history of colonization and recognizing some things that other organizations might have done to address it. And again, just taking a look at, um, you know, truth and reconciliation um, actions and what are what are they doing within their own organization, I think, as well as supporting events and invite, um, you know, invite us like, you know, we just want to be included, you know, like, there's a number of tech um, conferences that are going on. And, you know, there's talent there, they just don't know that it's happening. So, you know, just just including us. And, and I think also valuing our education, you know, like, one of the people I talked to from SIAT said a lot of people when they say, oh, it's it's an SIAT certificate, like, oh, it's somehow that's not as good. You know, um, it needs to be seen just as good as, uh, you know, Polytech or or a, a degree from the U of R, you know, so just just, you know, um, uh, valuing what what they've achieved and just inclusivity, I think, is huge and looking at our own bias and looking how we can make um, you know, how we can create opportunities to make people feel a lot more included. And again, not just hire one person, but build a community because nobody wants to just be that one person. So those are just some things that I, that I would say. Great points. Thank you, Alina. Uh, Leanne, do you have anything you'd like to add? Yeah, absolutely. I think those are all really great points. I think that probably the biggest message for allyship or those who want to support us is to invest in us and let us take the chance on solving the problem in our own way. Don't invest in us with a view to how you think it's best for us to solve our own problem. Uh, invest in us and give us the freedom to uh, do it in the way that we think respects our communities. And recognize that just as non-Indigenous people, we're not gonna get it right all the time, first time. And so sometimes that is investing and supporting us to fail forward and letting us fail forward. And uh, I, I find that one of the, the real challenges in the venture capital world for me as an Indigenous female tech startup is um, they don't want to give women or Indigenous women the same chance that they will give men. Uh, and men, you know, notoriously in the DEI research literature, you know, they'll apply and think they've got the job, even if they've only got 60% of the skills. Whereas women, you know, if we don't have 100% of the skills on our resume, we don't even apply. Um, so damn it, I'm a good risk. Um, we are a good risk. And uh, investing in us to raise ourselves up is just as beneficial uh, as uh, as uh, many other mo modes of allyship, but um, invest in us uh, in whatever way that takes, supporting um, Indigenous women going to the SIT program, which might include supporting childcare initiatives and transportation initiatives and housing initiatives and emergency funding, uh, or, you know, um, supporting them to have a mobile campus that can go out to supplement hybrid learning with some uh, inline experience, whether it's another one of their uh, magnificent buses uh, traveling out to communities or whether it's, it's a temporary uh, location um, near where they have a group of students in the world. Um, for me as, as an entrepreneur and for other um, Indigenous tech startups who I hope are out there with me. Um, it's recognized that um, we have no less ambition, desire, or acumen that you're investing in. Uh, we've been held from participating and uh, give us some time to learn the rules, support us while we learn how to participate, and then uh, we'll, we'll excel on the playing field. I love that, I love that. Uh, we have a couple more questions from the crowd. I'm loving this. Please keep them coming. We still have 12 minutes to address them. So uh, this is a similar question, but in the mean, it, but it has a slightly different take on it. Um, what can organizations do to create a more supportive environment for Indigenous women to grow their careers in technology? So Sharon mentioned a virtual internship role uh, made it more accessible for her. Are there any other ways that you can think of off the off the top of your head? So uh, who would like to go on that one first? I Alina, can, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna send it over to you, Alina. You get to go first. On yeah. this one. <laughs> I, mean, I, say, I obviously don't have as much experience, but I think one of the things that have been really successful is paid internships. 
Um, and then, you know, once, once you get somebody, so you start training them and then you pay them for internships and then employment. Um, you know, there has to be some sort of connection from school to employment. And I think that's super important. Um, so those are just some of the things that, that I have noticed. Um, but again, you guys have far more experience in this. So I'll, uh, I'll just let you guys uh, talk about that. Sharon, did you have anything you wanted to add? Yeah, um, like I said, the, uh, the, the virtual portion of it, being it, having it online, available online to students and everything. Uh, again, I'm, I'm so lucky to be working at SIT because they are having these conversations with us, right? And listening to my voice when I, uh, when I say this, this will help our, our program and things like that. So it is, um, uh, again, I just love my job. <laughs> <laughs> And Leanne? You know, I, I became a single parent when my daughter was uh, six years old. She's now 23. Uh, and so I really, uh, I, I think that it was especially helpful and I became acutely aware, especially when I went back to work at the U of S Edwards School of Business with Indigenous students, um, that they need to have support where they are uh, and for what they're doing. And I think that that's really important. I think in a world where we've seen hybrid and, and virtual work um, excel, uh, that makes the case for supporting in particular indigenous women where they are, whether they're at home in an urban setting, uh, to on reserve um, or in another community. Uh, I think that that's really critical to allow them that flexibility and support them where they are. I certainly uh, had flexible hours uh, that that made a huge difference for me, um, though virtual was not such an option then. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think creating a, uh, an environment, you know, where, I mean, there's lots of time throughout my career that I, you know, especially when my baby was younger, I mean, she was sitting on the floor in a meeting or in the back of a meeting room with her coloring books, a snack, and she was hanging out there. And I just didn't even ask permission. I just brought her. And uh, and after a while, people got okay with that. <laughs> um, and, and you know, and and I think it, it, it's thinking about that. When I was working at the Edwards School of Business, students would bring their kids in, and um, they'd hang out in the the resource center with me while their parent had to go to class because you know their their childcare had switched out for the day. Um, those are really critical. Um, but I think even more important is. Um, creating a sense of community, offering mentorship, true mentorship, uh, and, and creating a sense of community. And the worst thing I see organizations do, and I still see them do it today, is they hire one of us. And they plop us in like the full chocolate chip and the white chocolate chip cookie. And I'm like, yeah, no, I'd be disappointed if there was only one chocolate chip in my cookie and uh, I don't want to be there. Um, you got to create a sense of community, right? And and we've got to support each other. Um, both Indigenous people, we need to create that peer network amongst ourselves. And uh, also people need to understand. Uh, and and I, I like the notion, sometimes people call it reverse mentoring, but be mentored by an Indigenous woman. Uh, understand what our experiences are. Um, let us change your worldview instead of you thinking your job as a mentor is to um, in, continue the genocide of imposing your worldview on us. And and I think that that those sort of mentorship and peer arrangements are are really critical. And then you know take a chance on us. Like I mean, how many times have non-Indigenous organizations? Um, supported things that that have not been successful and they brush them under the table but oh my god if you do that enough and it doesn't work they walk away well give me a break um, invest in us um, give us a chance give us several chances in fact Love that. Uh, be kind and uh, give us chances and know that when you raise up particularly an indigenous woman you raise up an entire community thanks so good Thank you, Leanne. Can I just add something? Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, uh, again, according to the reports and everything like that, I had such, I was just had such good fortune that I, 
for me to be here and for this long in technology is it wasn't a coincidence. Uh, it, but I was lucky. And again, real, that luck has, has led me to be here and hopefully uh, mentor all these other women coming through our program. But when I first got started, one of the things that um, one of the advantages I had access to was my mentor was a woman who was in technology. So, and she had worked for uh, the city, the IT department of the city of uh, Calgary for something like 15 years by the time she got there. So she was a real pioneer for, and I don't consider myself a, a pioneer, mostly just because I had access to that. So being able to work with with her was uh, was really inspirational to me, and hopefully I can be that for more women coming into the technology today. Yeah, I I think Sharon raises a good point. I mean, we are I think we feel the responsibility to raise others up. Sometimes though, Sharon, don't 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 sell yourself short. You know, I have a friend who says, uh, "Luck is hard work meets opportunity." And, you know, we're hard workers. You were a hard worker, Sharon. And you got the opportunities and you took advantage of it. And, and I think most of us are, are hard workers and we want to take advantage of the opportunities, but too often opportunities are few and far between. Um, and, and maybe that's why it's so much more disappointing when an opportunity comes up and, and we're not immediately successful at it because we have so many less opportunities available to us. Um, but Sharon absolutely is an inspiration. She's an inspiration for me. Uh, and, uh, and you know, she does uh, amazing work. Um, and you can just see how her influence over her course of tenure at SIT has changed the demographic of the class. And don't underestimate that, Sharon. Um, the power of Thank indigenous you. female, indigenous matriarchy is, uh, I think, really becoming a formidable force. And we have to raise each other up and not not sell our own selves short um, as much as we like to rely on others to speak for us. And so I've spoken for you, Sharon. Uh, we also need to remember that we need to teach our people that humility is knowing what we're good at as well as what we're not good at. And it's okay to speak up of both, particularly when we're, we're working in the intersection of, of two worlds. Oh, I love that, Leanne. Quotable quote. Excellent. <laughs> Um, you know, we uh, we only have four minutes left, so I, I'll just also say from uh, the ethical digital perspective, we're certainly not perfect in this space. Uh, but some of the things that we have in place, we are virtual, uh, which makes some flexibility uh, a little bit there. We have flex time in place. So, you know, it's really about reaching those goals rather than the amount of time that you're putting in. Uh, we have had people who are having meetings with kids on their laps and that's okay. <laughs> and so uh, there's a few things that we also, another thing that we did take, we took a training, our entire team um, from the University of Alberta. And uh, it was a really well done. It was free at the time. I think it still is too, but that was a really great way to educate um, ourselves as well, just on some of the overall historical issues and, and and uh, really incredible um, ways that just sort of help the whole team kind of understand and and be more receptive. So there's some of the, some of the things that we've done internally as well on that on that side. Um, uh, there's two more questions here. We only have three minutes left, so we're gonna we're gonna do kind of a speed round here for the last two questions. One came in uh, uh, privately, um, and so if we can just maybe have one or two points uh, from each of you about this, but I think it's a great question. We've had difficulty finding candidates for posted opportunities across the province, and Leanne, I think this is coming right to you. <laughs> These positions uh, take many of the challenges you've mentioned into account, including remaining in their own communities and minimizing the barrier to entry through training programs. How can we connect with these women? And so uh, maybe I uh, actually I think there's probably a, a sentence or two from each of you, but uh, Leanne, why don't you go first? Yeah, I think one of the biggest challenges that employers have to face is you can't create the opportunity with, without creating a sense of openness, welcomeness in your company. Uh, and to sort of cold call up opportunities out there and not uh, feel that they, uh, the, the constituents you're uh, reaching out to have a place and see themselves there uh, or that they're really wanted there can be often one of the challenges. Uh, if we don't see ourselves in those places, um, we know it, we're just going to be the only chocolate chip in the cookie and that ain't easy even virtually. <laughs> 
<laughs> Add more chocolate chips to the cookies. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Leanne. How about you, Sharon? Um, <laughs> just drawn a complete blank. Uh, yeah, it's just, it, again, just creating that opportunity has to be meaningful and it's not just a, a tokenism, right? Uh, uh, again, I, I'm hoping that I'm filling uh, that uh, attitude of lifelong learning and technology and things like that to my students, not just the female ones, but hopefully seeing them in the classroom and uh, being able to work with them knowing that when they go out there, it's just making sure that that remote workforce is available. Again, because again, that relocation becomes a really big thing. I've had to relocate my, fam my little family like three or four times uh, just to get to this opportunity where I am now, right? So uh, just again, don't hire for the sake of hiring, know that we, we are capable, right? Uh, you know, and I am, <laughs> you know, I've got, <laughs> during the summer when uh, my time off, I like to do contract work just to get, get back into the actual support portion of, of my career. Uh, and just, uh, uh, I get a lot of recommendations. So not just uh, hire for tope, like, you know, just to have, Again, that one chocolate chip, uh, but to, uh, again, my, I'm hoping to create more chocolate chips and send them out there in, in, into many cookies. <laughs> Love that. And just, just uh, you know, uh, recognize a, a ability when you see it. Love that. And Alina, real quick, anything you want to add there? Yeah, I was just going to say is, um, you know, don't build something for people without including them in the building, you know, um, you know, like don't, don't build something without having as part of building it. It's kind of like, Hey, you don't even ask what the problem is, but here's the solution. And again, people want to know who's providing this solution and why weren't the community, the community knows what it needs. So you need to go to the community and ask what the needs are without having like a, an already set idea as what the solution is. And so, yeah, I mean, build it with the people that you're planning to serve instead of building something for them without them being involved is definitely helpful. I like that. And just to, to wrap this up, the person asking the question had a cute uh, response. I already have many chocolate chips. I'd like more. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so we don't have time for the last question just because we're wrapping up here. Uh, but well, actually, you know what? Let's just go once real quick. If you have to jump off the call, that's fine. Uh, really quick. Who are the uh, global tech leaders that inspire you? Uh, Leanne? Uh, I don't think I have a global tech leader that really inspires me because they're all mostly white men. Uh, and uh, yeah, so um, how, how, how could I, that would not be aspiring uh, to anything. Uh, uh, I'd like to be the Indigenous Global Tech Leader. <laughs> yes, heck yeah. Um, oh but Sharon's going to beat me to it. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say Sharon, so uh, that's that's where okay. I go. Yeah, so Sharon's the answer. Yeah, yeah, I love that. that. I go with that. Yeah. <laughs> and how about you, Sharon? Do you have somebody that you look up to or, or admire? Uh, you know, it's, it's, again, when I started, there weren't too many. And so... Um, my, my, uh, not a tech leader. In fact, I think she's left the industry at this point. <laughs> but uh, she's always been an inspiration to me because she works so long in in the field. And uh, right when our jobs were uh, so rare, right? And and now thanks to technology, where it's used in every single industry, uh, there's always going to be jobs waiting for us until uh you know the apocalypse and, <laughs> <laughs> and cell phones don't matter anymore <laughs> but it's going to um there's been a couple of women in uh Cisco that are that I really look look for um I wish I I wish I get a chance to meet them they're they're pretty awesome uh, and, 
networking is one of my favorite classes to teach. So <laughs> <laughs> I love that. So as you know, to summarize uh, and, and wrap things up here, if you need students, if you're looking for more chocolate chips, <laughs> please uh, reach out to Sharon. She's got uh, a, a crew of people that she can connect you with. Um, if you need services or need some technology developed or want to give some money, if you got some <laughs> venture capital funds or investment ready to go, uh, please reach out to Leanne. And uh, we're here as well at Ethical Digital. We're trying to do what we can to bridge the technology Indigenous communities. And there's a lot of other groups out there who are doing the same. So we're just, you know, trying to put gas on the fire. So in the meantime, we're hoping to have some major change starting in Saskatchewan that can go across the country uh, and uh, really start to make it so that in you know, 10 years, people are like, what? There's too many Indigenous women involved in tech. That's what we'd love to hear. <laughs> uh, but in the meantime, not possible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> in the meantime, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, this video will be shared. Um, this, you know, this is an important topic. We've just started the conversation. Please share with your communities as well. And let's keep this conversation going so we can see significant change in the internet. Uh, so thank you, everybody. Have a really great day.